Welcome. It's the final FAH Hockey Pro League show. Um, although we've got a few more matches to play, this is actually the last time we'll be gathering as guests, uh, which makes it uh, doubly special. I've got two great guests on today. Uh, we've got Jill Bone uh, from Belgium, who's actually uh, taken time out of her holiday to join us. So, so grateful to you, Jill, for doing that. Thank you and, and welcome to the show. Hi. Great to see you. Um, and we've got Simon Mason, the voice of hockey. Um, I'm calling him that, and I'm sure an awful lot of other people do as well. Uh, Simon, hello. Hi there, thanks very much. I, I won't claim that just my own. There's a whole team of us who have covered all the games this season. So I'm going to put my hand up right at the beginning and definitely that isn't just me there's a lot of people putting a lot of work into it but thank you there is and I've got to say I mean I've absolutely loved the commentary over these over these uh, past few weeks and months and uh, uh, I mean it brings the game to life for us so so, so thank you uh, for that as well um, it was a it was a big weekend of hockey this weekend some fantastic um, matches across the weekend uh, but before we talk about those games um, I think first of all we have to pay tribute to the Netherlands men who were crowned champions um, they they sealed the uh, sealed the deal with a draw and a win over India. Um, Simon, you've watched the Netherlands uh, men over the over the course of the season. What's impressed you about them? The, the difficulty with any team for any competition is peaking. Um, but if you look at what the Netherlands have done over the probably the last month in terms of integrating some new players and how those players have played and the less experienced members around their squad, I mean they've. They've gone into this last month of games and got better and better and better and stronger and stronger and stronger. And you look at the performances of De Vilda and Hodemarkers and Reenga and the fringe players as such who've come in and A, scored some absolute world-class goals, which we've all yeah. been delighted to see, but contributed to the likes of the, the Sevi Van Asses and the Thierry Brinkmans who now provide the cornerstones of that team. And the depth of talent that they've displayed, I think, is what's gotten the title. So mm -hmm. consistent performances and exciting electric individual skills, I think, is that is that beautiful combination that they've brought to the fore all the way through, but particularly in this last four to six weeks. Yeah, I mean, one of the comments that was made a couple of weeks ago, I think, when we were watching them play, I, I believe it was the Germany game, uh, is that since Jerome Delmay has, uh, has joined them, he's injected more pace over a consistency, consistently longer period of time into the team as well. Um, Jill, I mean, you, you know the Netherlands well, you know, they're, they're yeah. your next door neighbours. What are your thoughts on the Netherlands men's team at the moment? I think it's it looks like they, they play without the weight they had on their shoulder. It looks like even when they score goals, the celebration are more like joyful than before, where, you know, they, they had like all this pressure to, to perform and to score and to be better than the, the opponents. <clears throat> And now it really looks like I watched the last couple of games and it looks like a bunch of friends enjoying their hockey. Yeah. And they play so dominant for the, for the last uh, couple of games. And like, like you said, like scoring amazing goals, like that makes you want to watch them play. And I think that's, that's really exciting. And they'd be a serious team to, to consider in the, in the next World Cup for sure. Mm. And it's interesting what you say about scoring goals because I had a quick look. The top twenty amongst the top twenty goal scorers, the Netherlands have actually got a wider variety of players. I think they've got five players in that top twenty, as opposed to Belgium with three and India with three. Yeah. Uh, so you know that people are playing and, and scoring from all over the pitch. Um, the, the the match this weekend, I mean, India, India men, um, they've also, I mean, they've had a fantastic first season in the Pro League, and they're such a great team to watch. And I, again, I don't know how many how many matches you've seen. Jill, with, with India playing, but what are your impressions of them? And also, um, how important is it, for you, do you think, for India men to now be in the Pro League and to be playing match on match against this high quality? Is, that, is this the stepping stone that they needed, do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think they're, they've been playing some interesting hockey the last years already, but now to be able to compete against the top 10, or the, what, the top 9, that it, it brings their game more in, to be more consistent over the year and not only to be able to peak during the tournament. So <clears throat> it's going to be really interesting also. And to be, again, at home, it's for sure an advantage and, and for sure in India. So even for the women's team of India, it's going to be what they did in the last Olympics and how they're progressing. It's, it's going to be, yeah. It, it, I think it's wonderful for hockey to have diversity in, in the styles we're seeing. It's not only yeah. about... Uh, Belgium, Holland, Germany, and Australia. Sometimes, time we have a new type of really performing teams, and I think it's really great. 
Yeah, and it's not, it's not just the teams, it's the atmosphere that the teams are playing within as well. Yeah. You know, and if people are regularly going out to India and, it, and, and, and also having the, the India crowds coming to them as well, it just brings a different dynamic. And uh, I, I think it's a great spectacle for the game. Um, Simon Harmanpreet, he's uh, you know, you know, likely to be crowned top scorer. Uh, you're a goalkeeper. How much would you like to be facing Harmanpreet right now? There's, there's two things that I was a goalkeeper and no, no and never. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go nowhere You're still part of that goalkeeper union. <laughs> I just thank you, thank you for that. I, I just want to bounce back very quickly to something that Jill said because I agree with it completely. But I think you you asked how important is it for the Indian men to be in this competition, what it's done for them. I think it's done a lot, but they were on a trajectory, as Jill says, of, of performance. I think the big advantage for world hockey of the Indian men doing well is with the impact it has on the Indian women. Hmm. If we look culturally at sport within India, it's not as high profile, and for the men to be doing well, then increases the awareness of hockey and that then means that the women can come off the back of that and I think that's really important from a, a global gender <clears throat> equality policy for looking at Asian women's sport and how that impacts upon us as a as a global sport mm. um, so I fully respect what the men have done but I think the men as a catalyst to support the women moving forward I think is is crucial um, the harm pre scenario his numbers were skewed a little bit by South Africa yeah. Going down there and scoring 79 or whatever it was that he scored, um, <laughs> happily sat him at the top. But he does what he does very well. You look at all of the, you look at the power of corners, specifically in the men's game, the power of a Harman Pre, of a, of a Hendricks, um, who flickable, that basically if it's outside the goalkeeper's reach, are pretty much unstoppable. Um, it's It's amazing to watch. And I joked, I think it was on this podcast that I joked with with Yip Janssen that if I was in the Netherlands with a set of kit, I'd yeah. like to stand in goal just to experience it. Mm. I've got to go back to 2000 when I stood and faced Sahel Abbas, and he's the only man I've stood and faced without any knowledge of how I was going to save it because the ball was going <coughs> quickly. But you were talking about 50 millimeter bends on sticks at that point, yeah. so it was a different slingshot. And I think it's gone to that and beyond. So I would genuinely quite happily stand and go just to see what one was like and then retire to my more natural environment from a hockey playing <laughs> perspective, which is now the bar, um, <laughs> and see what, <laughs> see what the outcome was. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what speed the ball goes past you, wouldn't it? <laughs> Fast is the answer to that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, just just sticking with, with the Indian team for a moment, but actually also um, bringing the Belgian team as well. Uh, later on, I'm going to ask you both about some of your favourite moments in the in the Pro League, but certainly a couple of mine have been those flowing team moves that we've seen from both India and from Belgium, where it's five or six players, one touch hockey, and it ends in a goal. And I think that's fantastic. Um, but, you know, this is this is something that India are just bringing to the league, this, uh, this ability to play the flowing hockey. Um, looking at a completely uh, completely different team now, um, China, China women, uh, they played USA. Um, and we had two performances over two days where both teams were able to show what they were about. So um, China, we saw a very, very different, and, and Jill, you'll probably be able to, to comment on China's changing style of play and changing approach a little bit. Um, but they played some lovely, lovely hockey to, to win the first match. And then the USA did what I think we probably knew they could do, which is put up a very, very resilient defence and then steal a win on the back of it. They just haven't managed to until this point in the season. But um, just, just going back to China, um, we are seeing a different looking China team, aren't we, in a very short space of time under, under Alison Annan? Yeah, I watched, I watched the game against Belgium. I didn't watch a game against uh, the USA, but you could see um, it was two, the two games against Belgium were a bit different, but you can see a change also um, in the way they are playing, of course, but also in the emotions they are showing all of a sudden. And uh, well, we're going to see it's it's a really short time for Alison and to to make a huge impact. But China was not uh, a bad team in the first mm -hmm. place. So to pick up and bring that Alison Annan touch, it's going to be really interesting in, in the in the in the it, in the World Cup. And also, it's a team that works really hard. So whenever you say like it's only a month or it's only a couple of weeks they could do a lot of work uh, towards their goal. So, yeah, it's, it's a team to not, for sure, not un underestimate. And that is also going to be really exciting to see and, and develop. Yeah. Simon, what are your thoughts? Uh, I agree with Jill completely. I think if you've got a team that has a work ethic, and again, looking at the cultural framework that exists in, in Chinese sport, <laughs> it is a more dictatorial environment traditionally it's more about you, you, uh, 
um, almost a, a join the dots framework, if you like, there's less expression within it. And if we look back over the last four or five years, that's that's been apparent. But if you then drop in the knowledge of, of, an, of an Alison Allen, obviously, and wanting players to be happy in what they're doing and to express themselves, and then putting that on top of a really solid framework, it is exciting because you're only talking about Success in performance sport, you're talking about the top 5%. And that's the difference. I mean, you look all the way back to 2014 when the USA women in the World Cup did so well. That was off the back of an insanely fit side with a framework and then a couple of players playing right on top form. And that's the difference. And sometimes that's all the difference needs to be. So they're not coming from a long way away. They're coming from just underneath the radar and they've only got to pop up and be a I think I phrased it in commentary at the weekend about the the German ladies. I felt they were a disruptor. Yes. They were the sort of team who could beat a team once or twice in from the top four or five. They weren't going to go out and necessarily be favourites to win the entire thing. But if you got that perfect storm of results, and if you look back at the, the Irish ladies' silver medal in the World Cup, were they the second best team at that competition if they played all those games 10 times? No. Did they get a perfect storm of results that gave them the pathway and then they played right to top form regularly. Yes. And that's the beauty of having a real block of teams who can do that. And it makes for such exciting competition. So the Chinese are right there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things that I've noticed, certainly in the last few matches with the Chinese, if you're talking about small changes that, that sort of build into bigger, bigger um, results, it's this um, newfound confidence in making very good referrals, you know, because time yeah. and time again, um, Simon, I don't know if you've been advising them on those video referrals uh, with your history. Um, <laughs> they are they have they have been doing the most um, you know intelligent referrals very early in the game sometimes as well, and that's that's given them a level of confidence. Um, and the other thing I've been really impressed with is their goalkeeper Ping uh, Louis Ping. I mean, or Ping, sorry, Ping Louis, Ping Louis, who has been pulling off save after save, but also has exuded confidence from between the posts, which has got to give the you know her, her team a lot of confidence as well. Um, so, yeah, ex expect some exciting things from China, I think. Um, let's talk about England and Belgium, uh, the men's and the women's. And if we come to you first, Jill, uh, the women's team, it was um, a 2-1 two, two to England on the first day. It was a 4-1 to Belgium on the second day. So honours even. Um, but what were your thoughts on those two games? Well, I think on the first game, Belgium had a really good first half and then England dominated the second half. So I think a draw could have been a logic result, but they had like, they they've came back from the from the break quite strong in England and so yeah the win could be a good a good result and I think the second game yeah Belgium was so dominant so dominant so good so precise and then scoring the opportunities they had because scoring four goals against England having Maddie Hinch in, in goal is not something that happens every day and especially not for Belgium that has been uh, it's it's difficult Belgium the last pro league because sometimes well the first game is sometimes a bit tight and then the second game they run over their opponent so um, I think their the work in progress is 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 really good and really, I think that the confidence for the first time matched their technical and physical ability. So mm -hmm. you have a team, a young team still, that play with confidence and that work really hard the last couple of months. So it it makes you want to watch them also and be like, what are they going to do next? But also matching England, for example, on on physical terms, it's something that it's it's new so so that that i thought was really great to see and then for me you have a couple of amazing players that are standing out for the moment and that no one knows really and say like oh she's she she makes a couple of tackles that were impressive but Ellen Brasseur, for example i don't think she lost like one duel against any any forward of the england team so and she has 14 caps and it's been like this all season long. So I think those are really impressive players where you watch them and you say like, oh, they're on the right path. Yeah, and I, I, you're right. I mean, it's, it's that confidence within the team as well, isn't it? Because I think that's one of the things that used to be lacking. You know, you, you sort of yeah. walk on the pitch and, and, and you're walking on now with, with, a, with a huge confidence. Um, the other thing about, I guess, the Belgian team, and this is something that um, was commented on a couple of weeks ago, uh, they didn't have the Tokyo Olympics. So they've had an almost uninterrupted uh, build up towards this World Cup, 
um, which is which has also been very very good for them as well. I, I, I guess obviously the, the club league season has eaten into their time a bit, but they have had quite a quite a good run at things as well. Um, Simon used the phrase disruptor, um, and we've obviously got the example of both Spain winning the bronze and Ireland winning the um, silver in 2018. Could Belgium be right in that bracket now? Do you think? I think so. The the thing also that not being not playing the Tokyo Olympic has brought a lot of storm also in the team and to rebuild and to to after you know like a Olympic cycle is like really important to qualify or not qualify to Olympics uh, brings a lot to the team and 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 to not qualify like you know you're down mm. um, and to rebuild on that takes you some time and 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 they, they they did great and I think yeah they could be a big surprise and now it's like Simon said it's gonna be like do you have the good result at a good moment and when you see in the pro league you have two chains all the time one yeah. game away one game home one one go you know so. It's just now you have one game, you have to perform. You need to be on top on details on that game. You don't have the time to analyze and play it again the next day and see like who gets the best result. So that's gonna be interesting. I think physically they're 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 good and they're in, in top four or five teams uh, of of the, the, the tournaments. But now yeah, it's gonna be like, do you have the the luck of the winner a bit? Yeah. Are they gonna provoke their their, their luck to have that inside post in and not uh, hitting the post out and stuff like that so yeah it's going to be really interesting I think. Mm. I'm trying to think back to their they, they've got Australia in their pool haven't they um, yeah. I think Australia and Japan and Korea. South Africa. Oh, South, South Africa that's right yeah so Australia are going to be the real unknown because nobody's seen them. <laughs> no yeah, and, them. yeah it's, it's really hard the same as New Zealand and, and, and even China this, we haven't seen them for a long time now we see them and you can analyze some stuff but Australia like what is it going to be? How mm. fit are they going to be? How powerful are they going to be? Or how eager are they, are they going to be to win? So that's been the, the unknown. But I think if they play calm and with confidence and dominant hockey, I think they have all the chances to, to, to make a good result, even in the pool stage. Yeah. What about the men's, Simon? You, you watched the two men's games over the weekend. They were <laughs> exciting. Men's hockey at the moment has gone beyond exciting in terms of speed. It's just nuts. And when you talked earlier on about the, the Netherlands men and the pace they're playing at, and Jeroen Delmay, when we interviewed him, was talking about a desire for his side to play at sprint pace and England were the best team to play against in that manner because they just play fast. Now, I, I am openly critical. I think if you just play fast all the time, you become predictable. And I, I asked Zach Jones about that at the weekend. And he was talking about, yes, you do need sometimes to play slower to, for the speed to be effective. But if we look at the fact that England want to play quickly, Belgium want to play quickly against them. Um, Belgium have, and this is a ridiculous statistic, if Art van Doren and Loic Loipart had played at the weekend, they would have had over 4,000 caps <laughs> in their squad. England, with a reasonably experienced squad, have 1,400. It's, it's, it's insane the depth of knowledge that they have across that group. I do worry a little bit about what's going to happen after Paris in terms of Me too. if you if you lose three and a half thousand of your four thousand, it's going to be tricky to rebuild. Jill's already talked about rebuilding after Olympic cycles, but let's not get hung up on that. Let's just enjoy it. And I think the beauty for the Belgian men is that they're an experienced side for whom play is almost instinctive these days. There's no conscious thought. You remove. 0 0.1, 0 0.2 of a second on every movement because you already know what your teammate's going to do. And that's the difference between success and failure. We talk about flow and we talk about fluidity and that's what unconscious movement creates. It appears effortless and it creates time in its own right. And that's what we're seeing. And then you couple that with some brilliant technicians. The set plays are so strong the ability to, to finish from all sorts of angles. I mean, you look at the goal that Arthur de Schlover scored on the backhand at the weekend. That's insane. He's a fullback. I mean, he's literally in a fullback. He's picked up a drop ball behind the body into the circle, one touch, and then smashed it over Ollie Payne's head from a tight <laughs> angle. I mean, if you've got someone who doesn't feature on your scoring list, kind of at all, if you see what I mean, and then he's capable of popping up in a high position, executing a difficult skill on the run, You've almost got this, this magical ability to go, it doesn't matter what an opponent does. If we pick, and I'll pick him deliberately because Jill's on the call, if we pick Tom as a focal point of the defence and say we have to double team him because he's so dangerous, 
you've just given space to three other people. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's brilliant to watch. I feared prior to Tokyo that the, to the tournament being a year delayed was going to be their downfall. That wasn't to be. They started slowly and grew into it. And it'll just be interesting now. They're only what, eight months, nine months out from the World Cup and they look full of confidence and they're exciting to watch. But that's the same as the top men's and women's top four, top six in both competitions. The range of talent it's gone beyond the physical. It's now the inventive. It's the creative. It's the passes that people see and execute. I think the Belgian women have picked up on what the Belgian men led on, which is the overhead passing stuff, the 3D element in the beginning. And again, I was openly critical when they started trying it. It gave away a lot of possession. But all of a sudden, it seems like it's now into the right pockets, on the right angles. It's opening up spaces. And it's, just, it's brilliant to watch that invention as a team and as an individual. And so the men, are, the men are going to be right up there. I wished that Tom's goal in the second game had, hadn't happened after the whistle, uh, the one where he flicked it over the goalkeeper, because that was, you know, it's everything you're talking about, isn't it? It's creativity, innovation. And, and actually, you're right, if, if everything else is flowing so well, it allows your brain space to think of doing the unusual and the original, which is, uh, which is great. Um, Jill, you know, can, can you add to that? What, what, what are your thoughts on the Belgian men's not not just their performance this weekend, but over the course of the season. Yeah, I think this weekend was also their, their best performance. I think they get really tired. They're looking forward for their their, their yearly holidays, um, and rightly so. It's been a long season, uh, but yeah, I think they're they're just well, and, and maybe I'm biased, obviously, but they're just so great to play. And I think obviously I, I'm I'm a forward, and you may think like I I like the forwards, but for me like Arthur Van Doren, Arthur de Slover like what they are doing with their sticks. And like you say, like all of the sudden, but Van Doren can also do it, get into the circle and then just gonna smash it in the net. And he'll be like, where do you come from even? So <laughs> then they've played also some games missing like eight or nine top 12 players and still be so performing. So, you, you know, I was, I'm, I'm a bit concerned also after the, after the Olympics, what it's gonna be, but you still have Artur de Slover, Artur van Doorn, Victor Wenier. They're still, they're still quite lo- young. So it's going to be a double generation gap where the older ones are going to stop, but they're still, then the younger one of this team are going to be the older one and yeah. they're going to have to manage to, to find new talents and there are some coming uh, and they have more, more and more space to, to be able to play a couple of games. So it's going to be interesting, but I think it's one of the team that I look at hockey even on a free day you know and and even if my brother wasn't playing off a couple of fans you know and and i think yeah they're they're going to be exciting like you said you you can feel that they they just know where they're going to be like in some leads in some passing you know you could have a back end crossing pass and the guy would just be like receiving in his forehand scoring goal and they would be like oh yeah i didn't even see that pass they just know each other so well yeah, I mean, when I when I watch um, Belgian men, Indian men, et cetera, et cetera, um, and then I might turn on the TV and I might pick up on a football game or something like that, it always astonishes me that we haven't got millions and millions of people watching hockey because it is so fast and it's so skillful. Yeah. Um, is it just, just I have a little bit of a segue here, but in, in Belgium, because you're getting all of this success, are you seeing higher and higher numbers of people spectating and recognizing the players and, you know, idolizing them as, as elite sports people? Yeah, it, it has changed a lot. And even at club level where, where we're building a lot in the youth schools and, and, and to, you know, to make that base like stronger and stronger. Yeah, the Red, the Red Lions and the Red Panthers have, have become like, yeah, they have a lot of fans and, 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 and even even the players or younger players or even older players like admiring them but also the, the thing is between football and hockey they're so accessible you know they're just hanging out in their club yeah. or after a game after a game you can have like a, a, a moment with Felix Denayer, Victor Wenye, uh, you know and just they're just hanging out there and, and they're so approachable and so that that makes it also grow like the kids just like you know, you, you go at school and, and some is fan of Cristiano Ronaldo. It's almost impossible that it's ever going to watch and see him. Yeah. And if you're a fan of Victor Wenier, you just come to racing and he will for sure have a, like a little chat with you. So that all of, the th- all of it together and the hockey is growing and it's exciting. Yeah, they, they, they become yeah, it's 
both icons or at least that that have a, a large number of fans. Have you um, walked down the street and seen somebody wearing a Boone shirt? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. 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 Also, they have the Tombonoki camps, and 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 so you sometimes see kids just like, and you're just like, oh, that's a hockey player. You know, he has the yeah. the, the shirt. So yeah, it, it happens. <laughs> no, that must be that must be absolutely great. Well, one, one country where hockey doesn't need to be sold at all. Well, two countries where hockey doesn't need to be sold at all: uh, Argentina and India. Um, Argentina <laughs> women this weekend they'd already been crowned the champions. Um, Gorzolani is likely to be crowned the top scorer uh, at the end of the season. They actually went through the season undefeated. Um, Argentina, uh, they're, they're going to be right there in the World Cup, aren't they? And and um, they're looking very exciting. Jill, what's what's your over the season your impression of Argentina? Yeah, I think well, I, I love the country and and I love their their they're so driven and so passionate about the game. And now now I, well, I watch the games against Holland and you can see like their physical abilities. It's unreal. And I know how much they train. It's just like there is no well, maybe the, the Asian teams that I don't know, but there, it's a team that works like really really hard. And you would not always acknowledge that, but they work so hard physically, like two or three times a day when they're training in the training uh, program and stuff like that. And now they have sometimes what is not my favorite part of the game, they dribble a lot, mm -hmm. uh, but also th that if they can combine it with some passing game and always wanting to go forward, that makes hockey like enjoyable. And they, they, they have some couple of players that are just outstanding. And I talked about last time about, about Rime Cedres and also I've watched her play in, in, in in Belgium, and she was like an outstanding opponent. But uh, also to watch her at that level in national team, which is so calm and have that mix of going forward and dribbling, but also like changing sides and then play the open side. And I think they're going to be, yeah, they're going to be great. And it, I don't think this time it's not going to be like who's going to win, like Holland or Argentina. They have a, a lot of opponents that uh, that can can make it hard for them. But yeah, for me. Besides Belgium, then uh, she's, <laughs> it's uh, it's one of my favorites thing uh, to to for the to be to become champion. Yeah, I mean Simon, they couldn't be separated in their um, previous pro league matches except through the penalty shootout. Um, the uh, Netherlands, Argentina going into the World Cup, as Jill says, it's not just about those two, is it? But uh, you know, that there's there's every chance we'll see those two teams there at the very end. I agree with that. The, the Netherlands Argentina game, the Pro League, was just the two games. Were just it was a fabulous weekend. Um, it's interesting what what Jill says about not not being a big fan of their dribbling because I I would agree with her. And it's it, at times they can get one dimensional. They just get it and dribble, and there's almost it's almost chaotic and it's a lack of structure. And most teams are afraid of that and therefore when you step away from it and you give them the space and the opportunity to accelerate a Granato and Albertadio or Cedras as you talk about will use the space that you get given whereas when the Netherlands played in the last round of pro league games it felt they stepped out really aggressively they denied space they almost sucked the oxygen out of the game and that was the closest that any teams really got to Argentina and it rattled them a little bit they do have a better passing dynamic now and when they mix it up it gives opportunity but it does I, I just think it's shown a couple of other teams that you know what this is how you are successful against Argentina they got very few high opportunities you didn't see Granata sisters running through the 23 you didn't see the opportunities in the circle you didn't create set plays for Gorzolani to step up and do what she did so I think that the answer to beating Argentina is you have to go toe to toe. You've almost got to play a back half man to man. So player to player, whatever. <laughs> I apologize for terminology um, that the player to player defense and therefore snuff out the, the oxygen that they want to build their flames on. Um, mm. And so there is a fallibility, but they are so exciting. Their individual ball carrying skills are just insanely good and they're a delight to watch and they they inspire so many people their domestic hockey culture is is based on how yeah. well they do and the crowds that we see are just uh, fantastic to watch brilliant which brings me to wrap up and ask you probably the most difficult question uh, that i can um you know in terms of what's been going on um over this course of this amazing pro league season what have been your standouts in terms of both maybe surprising teams um great moments or players that have just stood out for you. Um, who am I going to throw to the Lions first? Jill, 
What are your thoughts? And, yeah, maybe I'm a, a bit biased, but um, I would say from Belgium, I said Michelle Struik. She's yeah. been playing like amazingly in the midfield and so strong and scoring a, a, a cool goal against England. But she just like wins so many duels. And it's been so important in her connection with Barbara and Ellen in the midfield, like bring space and it's just so smart. And I'm, I'm really impressed how she grow in that leader uh, model on the field. Um, for me, and my favorite is like Charlotte Anglebert. She has so mm. much speed. And if she can manage to lose maybe a little less balls and it she just brings something else. And yeah, for me, I, I don't want to talk about her too much because no one know her really well so that could be like the surprise card for <laughs> Belgium but, but uh, Ellen Brasseur defensively you know she's just like so small and so skinny like, almost but defensively so strong winning every duel almost like I think it's unreal I, I, I want to know her stats on 1v1 but um, yeah and from from the the, the the Holland for example the Netherlands I really like the, the younger Teams, a couple of girls that I played with uh, in Oranje Road, you have Freke Moose in the forward line. That it's just so nice to watch her play. I knew her; she was like 18 and now to, to watch her uh, play so well with with the national team. And and, and Laura Nuning also like I think it's she's just so great and it's just so nice to 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 watch her play. Really, brilliant. Yeah, I've, all of all of those names are actually on my list that I've got written down here as yeah. well. Um, Simon, what's your take on that? Well, you sent me the WhatsApp about half an hour before the programme and said, can you have a think about players? And We're all about preparation here, Simon. We're all about preparation. Very, which is great. It's more than I normally get for a question <laughs> like that. So really boring. I keep all the team lists from all the, all the games and I kind of flip back through because the issue is that for, for me is that every weekend there's a highlight and we've now done, what, seven or eight weekends on the spin and I can remember stuff from the last two or three weeks, but then you, you think back and thought, oh, what about that goal that was six months ago? And the type of things that you just simply forget and the danger of a of a conversation like this is there's people screaming at the podcast going well what about that and yeah. they don't yeah. want to offend anybody so the recollections are probably fairly recent but from from a, a women's perspective I think Xander Vard for the Netherlands has, has bossed their midfield consistently mm -hmm. over the last period of time and she's just absolutely brilliant in terms of how she's been playing then to highlight one of the Belgian names, I think Amber Ballenkain has just been brilliant if you look back over the last probably 18, 12 to 18 months of growth. And when she first came in, it was, there was, in my opinion, there was, there was almost a weakness about what she did, a physical weakness about ball um, collection in the circle and how she then got things away. And suddenly she's collecting balls with beautiful touches. She's added the penalty corner option. She has a strength in the front line and it creates space for other players because of, of what she's done. I just admire how she's grown over the last 12 to 18 months. Argentina, it's hard to ignore Maria Granato and Albertario just because they're exciting and you watch them and they and they do what they do, which is brilliant. But I've now I've now completely ignored speaking about about 20 other people who are on this. So <laughs> they're, the, they're the, just the, the moments that, that stick in your mind from a men's perspective. If we're if we're again identifying individual skills, then Martin Ferrero for Argentina. Yeah. It looked like at the start of the Pro League campaign that he'd spent the entire pandemic just dribbling in his garden and basically just basically doing 3D skills because I think he's faded away a bit at the end of the campaign. But in the first stages, the first half, he was just unbelievably good. And I, I, I will go back, however, to the Netherlands for my sort of pick, which is I think Thierry Brinkman has grown as a player to become a real leader. I mean, he was a fiery... I'm going to use the word petulant, which you won't like when I next see him. But when he first started, he properly arguey, fiery player who came and, and went out of games. And he now leads other more experienced mm -hmm. people. And that allows someone like a Yorick Krohn to then feed off that and therefore my moment from the men's game. Because you asked about it, it was only a couple of weeks ago was Yorick Krohn's overhead pass. So yeah. aerial to left midfield, turn around right for aerial, which he correctly said at the end of game interview was the only reason he threw it was because he didn't have any legs left to keep running <laughs> as he threw it over the top. And then Hodemark has volleyed it or half volleyed it in. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about Jill, but as you think back, you can almost look in your mind's eye and things pop out and you can imagine a Gigi Oliver slide pass through a really narrow gap you can and therefore we could happily sit here for hours and talk yeah. about the brilliance of the athletes in our game and if you go all the way back um 
Sarah, to what you talked about, about how you can't believe more people don't know about our mm. sport. And whilst we are wholly biased, if we can just get people to see those moments, those stand up off your seat type skills that we're seeing week after week, I genuinely think that the game as a spectacle is in a brilliant place and the athletes we have are just fabulous, genuinely fabulous. And I have a long list of people that I've now upset by not mentioning. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, what, what I've really enjoyed about this season um, is the way that it's been an unfolding story as well. You know, we started at the very beginning and you weren't certain what certain teams were going to be like, but we've, we've watched a story and a narrative unfold where these people have emerged. You know, I'm sort of in my head, I'm playing a documentary or a film where you've got these, these guys emerging at the end as heroes. And, and, and they are because they've, they've just put on such a spectacle of hockey and it's so exciting for the next few events and the next few, uh, next few months. Um, we need to wrap up. I mean, we've, as you say, quite rightly, Sam, we've, we've got lists and lists of players who, who are very, very worthy of mention who we haven't who we haven't touched on at all. But uh, it's it's been a great season. We've got a few more games to come up. We've got uh, USA uh, women, India women, China, Netherlands. Um, and also Netherlands versus Spain uh, men over the next few days. But that will be the end of the Pro League. We're moving to the uh, Women's World Cup. We have the Commonwealth Games. Eventually, we've got the Men's World Cup as well. Thank you so much for spending time talking to us. Um, not just you two, but as we said at the start, there's a whole team behind this of other guests as well. Uh, but thank you very much for being here today and uh, talking us through. My pleasure. You're welcome. Thanks very much. Check it out.